Accord to the cloud. Now you know. Good evening and welcome to No More Fear You Grow, a committee of Petaluma Urban Chat. I'm Dan Like, and as always, thanks to Sharon Kirk, Dave Alden, and the host of other people who make this happen. A couple quick notes. We have been Zoom bombed. We may be Zoom bombed again. If things get weird and your screen goes blank, hang on for a minute or two and we'll get back. If you think I kicked you uh, unfairly, come back in and we'll have a waiting room and we'll let you back in. This evening is the sixth in our general plan series, 20 months of forums intended to help Petaluma residents better understand the topics that will be addressed in the general plan update and become better advocates for the land use future they want for our town. Coming up on June 23rd, the municipal finance context, and then on June 30th, I believe we're making up for that missed session by talking about transportation. We probably have people who are subject to the Brown Act and want to respect the intent of California's public meeting rules. We'd like to keep the conversation guided more towards general land use issues than specific site ones, although I think there'll be some specific site mentions tonight. Thank you to Josh Simmons and Petaluma Civics who are rebroadcasting this meeting on Twitch and Facebook and YouTube and all the places the millennials are. And with that, I'm gonna turn to the monitoring the chat for questions and trying to manage uh, the inevitable background kids trumpet practice and turn this over to Natasha Juliana who has put together this evening's presentation. Natasha, it's all yours. Thank you, Dan. And thank you also, Sharon, for all the work behind the scenes. And I also wanna thank uh, Dave for encouraging me to reach out beyond my known circles on the off chance that someone great out there would be willing to speak with us. And it worked. And tonight I am thrilled to introduce Carl Elefante, live with us all the way from Maryland. Luckily, he's a night owl, so he's not minding staying up late with us. Um, I know Carl is going to tell you more about his background, so I just wanted to let you know how grateful we are for all of the time and energy and enthusiasm that Carl put into preparing for tonight. He went above and beyond. We had several Zoom meetings, many emails. He looked into all kinds of documentation that we sent him and he has really um, tried hard to get to know our little city of Petaluma. We're hoping he even comes for a visit someday so we can show him around in person. Uh, the evening is going to um, go as follows. We're gonna have a, Carl's prepared about a 45 minute presentation for us. And then the next 45 minutes is gonna include Q and A and a brainstorming session that Ann Edminster has, has agreed to help with. So stick around for that and we'll have some participation and uh, ways to continue the conversation. So without further ado, Carl, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, Natasha. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for all the help that you've given me. And, and then also Dave Alden and, and Ed Edmin, Ann Edminster and, and Dan like, you know, this wouldn't be happening without all the contributions from everyone to really make this happen. Um, I'm going to press the magic button here and hopefully be sharing my screen with you. Um, and uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and jump right in. Um, uh, I, I wanna uh, cover a lot of material and I'm gonna go through it quite quickly. And it's more important to sort of get the arc of, this, of tonight's presentation than to get too uh, hung up on any of the details because I'm gonna try to throw a lot of uh, data at you. But uh, you know there won't be a test at the end. You know this is really sort of getting the uh, the, the the again the arc of the conversation. Um, I'm going to start by uh, spending a couple of minutes and just you know uh, do my doing my favorite thing, and then it's talking about myself, of course. Um, you know, so why in the world would anybody invite me to be part of a discussion about what uh, the future of Petaluma might look like? Um, if, if anybody out there has heard my name before, it's likely that it's associated with uh, having coined the phrase, the greenest building is one that's already built. And, and uh, with that, you really understand two things about me that have literally shaped my career. And that is the importance of sustainability and kind of green, what green appropriate, environmentally appropriate uh, development is about. And then the other is the importance of existing building resources. And that's really going to inform everything I talk about tonight. Um, a, a little bit more about my background. So I've spent this 
absolutely fabulous career as an architect, working in some of the most beloved and precious places that you can imagine. Uh, just really, you know, pinch me just what a wonderful career I've had. So it's really given me a, a, a strong, strong orientation to the importance of a stewardship attitude about how we treat the world around us and how the world around us ultimately affects us as people. Um, I'm also very much, as you can tell from the color of my hair, you know, a child of the 60s. I, you know, was a absolutely uh, hair down my back, you know, a card carrying hippie back in the day. Um, and I, I find a lot of parallels to the world of the 60s that I became a te teenager and an adult in and what's going on in our world today. Really, it is the best of times and the worst of times. It's just this full of miracle and also full of things that are really troubling and uh, we really need to wrestle with and, and get our arms around. And I'm gonna talk about both aspects of that, of our world today, tonight. Um, I wanna quickly mention three influences from my college years in New York City, learning how to be an architect. Uh, the first is uh, the awakening to the environmental movement. And I'm sure that you know all of you are familiar with Rachel Carson and her book, The Silent Spring. And, and what ultimately, while I was a student in New York, led to the first Earth Day and the notion of environmental stewardship and the, and the rise of the environmental movement. Very parallel to that in New York City at those, that same period was the rise of the historic preservation movement. Um, the destruction of Penn Station had happened just before I moved to New York City. Um, it was a, uh, an act of urban vandalism of historic proportions, and it literally led to the political change uh, that allowed the Historic Preservation Act of 1966 to be passed. It, it, th this vile act gave the political will to create the Historic Preservation uh, you know, movement in the United States. And then, of course, in New York City, the Jane Jacobs, uh, uh, Robert Moses battle was literally being waged all around me uh, and was affecting the city real time. Um, the proposals to tear down vast sections of the cities were being, were, were being fought over while I was there. So that, that's kind of who I am. And uh, you will hear that person speaking tonight. You'll see those influences that, that have uh, stayed with me throughout my career. So let's get to topic one here, the climate crisis. And I want to bring a perspective on it, which again is parallel to those formative years in my life. And the, the world that John Fitzgerald Kennedy faced as he became president of the United States um, everybody remembers parts of this speech, particularly the ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That was actually just after the real crescendo of the speech, which was this part of it, where he talked about the impending uh, danger, the existential danger of nuclear holocaust as a result of the uh, Cold War that he, he faced. And his attitude, expressed in these words was that his generation had been granted the opportunity to deal with this. And our generation has been granted the opportunity to deal with the climate crisis. We, we, we got picked. We didn't, have, we didn't get to volunteer. We got picked to take care of this crisis. It's our job to do it. We have to do it now. Let's bring a Kennedy attitude. Let's take the, the, the threat of nuclear weapons and turn it into the promise of the space race, turn the, turn the weapons, you know, the nuclear arms race into the space race. That's what we need to do with climate change. Um, uh, the hour of maximum danger is something that means a whole lot different thing to us now after having gotten through 2020. We've literally seen a situation that required global cooperation to, to address a direct and immediate existential threat to the whole human race in 2020. How'd we do? Did we get an A on that? 
I don't think so. I think we really have to ask ourselves, are we really prepared? Do we, are we ready to bring to bear what we need to uh, cooperate on a global crisis of the dimension of the climate crisis? This was a warning shot across the bow. Uh, the nuclear holocaust hour of maximum danger is much easier to get your brain around than the climate crisis is. The climate crisis is in everything we do. It's in how we move, it's in how we build, it's in what we eat and how we raise that food. It's in everything we do. And that means uh, an incredible paradigm shift on, in every field. Are we ready to do that? Can we do that in such a way that we see a positive outcome for, from it? Um, I'm not gonna spend any time on the dire facts of the climate crisis. Uh, if you don't understand the existential threat that it is, uh, there's plenty of information out there. Uh, if you're not worried about it, you should be. Get worried about it, get motivated about it because it's, it, it, it's unbelievably important and we've been asleep at the wheel for a long time. Been asleep at the wheel for 50 years. It's time to get busy. Um, uh, who better than Al Gore to make this statement that we have to get the political will aligned with the scientific necessity of what climate change requires in us. You know, I have to tell you, it brings a tear to my eye that hanging chads prevented this country from having climate change be its number one priority in 2000. It's, it's terrible. We've lost 21 years. Uh, we need to make up serious lost ground. 50% uh, of the carbon in the air was put in the atmosphere since 1980. We've doubled the problem since 1980. So it's time to act now. Um, uh, Bill Gates uh, you know, is someone that has a certain amount of credibility in certain circles. Uh, and his book that defines the sort of scope of the crisis, I, I recommend it as a, as a resource. You know, we have to change everything. We have to alter it. Uh, so uh, let's get busy at it. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, every country, and by the way, every city, every community, every corporation, every organization and family and person needs to change its ways in order to get our hands around this problem. If, if we can't make it something positive and give ourselves a reason that will benefit us to do it, we're not gonna do it. So we have to find that silver lining here. So let's talk about that. Let's find that silver lining a little bit. It starts with recognizing that climate change is interconnected to many situations in, in our world that need attention. Uh, I live in the Washington DC area. This city has serious intransigent social, economic and environmental issues that it has not done a very good job with for a long time. We've been cleaning up the river for 50 years. You still can't swim in it. How long does it take to clean a river? The, 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 in Copenhagen, they cleaned it up in less than 10 years. You can swim in the harbor now. Why is it taking us 50? Um, again, the knowledge about this, the notion of what uh, this resource versus uh, demand curve looked like is something that we've known for 50 years. Uh, the literature on this is really excellent. If you have any questions about any aspect of the social, economic, and environmental uh, issues that we're facing, there's been a lot of work done on it. And you know, even just this, this notion of sustainability that was put forth by the Brundtland Commission in 1987 really laid the groundwork for what we're doing today. Um, I just want to take a minute to just point out about one year's worth of work. So in 2015 and 2016, three international events took place which redefined our future. Now, if we would just pay attention to it and actually utilize it and actually act on it, uh, our, the roadmap's pretty well, uh, pretty well drawn for us to follow. So in September 2015, the Sustainable Development Summit in New York City, where the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted these 17 sustainability goals. 
Um, uh, just a few months later in Paris, we all know of that, with the adoption of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, uh, we owe our future to Christiana Figueres, who was the diplomat who figured out how to get 195 countries to agree to do something about climate change. She's brilliant. Uh, and then less than a year later in 2016 was the Habitat 3 Summit in Quito, Ecuador, where the parallel of the urbanization of the world, the urban future of humanity was really established. So we have a problem to solve. We have to solve it with our cities because by the end of the century, nine in 10 people are gonna live in cities. So whatever the problem is that we're gonna solve, we have to solve it with how we treat our cities and how our cities will therefore shape what we do. Um, uh, so I've just talked about this information that was developed by the United Nations. We all know that the United Nations is just a bunch of ill-informed, uh, uh, self-involved uh, bureaucrats that, that don't have anything to do with our lives. Um, so why should we listen to them? Well, uh, if that's your attitude, would you listen to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's taking care of the largest military in the world and who's and whose job is keeping our country safe. Um, so Mike Mullen, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, had uh, this document prepared. Uh, he was surprised to find that there really wasn't a, a, a new strategic outlook that the military was really supposed to be living by. The last person to develop it was Dwight D. Eisenhower when he was president of the United States. So it had been decades since the, the US military had updated their strategic outlook on their job. And what he came away with is almost exactly the same thing that the United Nations just came away with. Climate change is the biggest threat to our country. Uh, we're trying to solve 21st century problems with 20th century attitudes. And on top of that, our citizens are completely unengaged uh, and, and aren't even really connected to really trying to solve these problems. They're thinking about other things. And that's what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff determined between 2007 and 2011, when he was responsible for our safety. Uh, so it's not uh, just theory. This is real stuff uh, that uh, requires real action uh, and it's urgent. So what is, what's the context of this? How do we find this silver lining? How do we find how responding to the climate crisis actually fits into our future as, as a global species that must work together? Um, and look, it starts with understanding that in the 20th century, people began to understand that the world was shrinking to a point where we truly are all one, that our species, it cannot survive if we, are, if we consider ourselves to be uh, competing stakeholders. We are testing the resources of the earth to a point where the only way it will work is for us to work cooperatively. And uh, I, I don't know of anyone that's, that understood that better or expressed it better than Arnold Toynbee. Um, Today, as, as we're here, we are not just at the dawn of the 21st century anymore, but really at a time when the 21st century is hitting its stride. Um, we now understand the characteristics of the 21st century. How is it different now? Well, there, Bruce Mao really identified as two things. One is we now have the capability of completely revolutionizing every aspect of human activity. And in his uh, exhibit and book, Massive Change, he takes 21 endeavors of human, of human activity from medicine to architecture to, and many others. And he shows that each of them is poised for dramatic change in the 21st century. And I'll tell you, this blows the top of your head off. I mean, every single field is uh, experiencing revolution. It's not just evolution, every field. The other thing that he identified was the acceleration at which this is happening. It's mind blowing. Uh, this makes going from the Wright brothers to the moon in 66 years, 
where we are now, that's slow. Things are happening much more quickly than that now. Um, the other thing that we've learned about the 21st century is the reality of uh, us really having to be intentional about outcomes. So if we want peace, we have to work for justice. We have to understand that actions have consequences. If we want outcomes, we have to plan the actions to get those outcomes. And we have to behave that way. There's no other way to do it. We have to be intentional and follow that intention through with uh, uh, determined action to, make, to bring those outcomes about. Um, and then I just want to, I'm going to now really bring this into the realm of the built environment. And uh, I don't know anyone who's ever said anything more true or more profound about the built environment than this famous architect, Winston Churchill, you know, who, who said these words, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. Um, and uh, he meant it in a very immediate personal way, you know, with aching knees going upstairs and things like that. But it's just as true in a very big world, large scale way. And again, I know of no one who talks about this better than Ed Glazier and his triumph of the city. What Glazier is trying to help us understand is we think that civilization shaped cities. Glazier says, no, 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 stand that on its head. Cities shape civilization that cities created the circumstances in which human cooperation was possible. And so the, the shaping happened first, the chicken or the egg, he's, he figured out that it's the city that shaped the civilization more than the other way around. If you don't shape the conditions to support human activity, it doesn't happen. It gets frustrated by the, by the conditions that it, it's in. And uh, I'm gonna really work that point a lot tonight. Our resistance to this, and I know I saw more, more furrowed brows than I saw smiles when I was just talking about that. We resist this as Americans, we uniquely resi resist this because our anti-urban attitude is right in the Declaration of Independence. It is in our constitution of the United States. It is in the thoughts of the founders. And you know the very uh, now well-known uh, competition and conflict between Thomas Jefferson and uh, Alexander Hamilton couldn't uh, say this any better. And you know what did Thomas Jefferson do? He built an elite school for educating the elite classes on the backs of enslaved people in the in up in the hills of Virginia, because that was his idealized world that he wanted to create and completely ignore all the negative circumstances that it took to actually create that, including getting into debt and enslaving people, et cetera, et cetera, compared to Alexander Hamilton, who said, you know what we need? We need cities that will encourage immigration and that will give both skilled and unskilled workers a way to contribute to our society. Plus, by the way, we need to build factories that can build guns. And the very, very first thing that got built there was a gun factory because we, the only way we run, won the Revolutionary War was by borrowing guns from, from France. And he knew that that was not a sustainable way to have a country. So he was a realist too. Um, so this conflict is deeply, deeply in our roots as Americans. We have a, a, an urban schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenia, and it's just as real in modern cities as it was between Jefferson and Hamilton. The, the battle between Jane Jacobs and, and Robert Moses, Robert Moses mostly won that battle. Our cities were more shaped by Robert Moses than they were by Jane Jacobs, and here we are all these decades later, and we're finally starting to listen to Jane Jacobs. And we're finally starting to realize that cities are for communities of people, not for cars. So uh, let me just dwell a little bit more on built heritage and the lessons that we actually get from paying attention to our cities. Um, built heritage is part of a universe of heritage. It's kind of a special part of it. There's lots of other things to pay attention to in heritage, 
But, you know, my world is Built Heritage. I'm going to tell you about some of the things that I've learned from being involved in Built Heritage as, as an architect, as a professional. Um, the, the first is that uh, it's extremely durable and it's all around us. And can you imagine uh, just our, our sense of ourselves, of human civilization, uh, of, our, of our own country, Without built heritage, you know, what would our understanding be without built heritage? It's absolutely central to our understanding of, of ourselves. Um, it, it's also beyond the icons. And uh, there's, there's probably not a better story to tell than the story of Mount Vernon, which is actually the first historic preservation project was the uh, the, the, the preservation of Mount Vernon, which was literally falling apart over almost 150 years ago. And uh, the, the, the desire to preserve the story of George Washington. Well, in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, that has turned into the desire to tell the whole story of George Washington and, and recognizing that he enslaved more than 300 people in order to be able to have that great house on the hill and to become the great person and the founder of the nation that he was. He was also an incredibly innovative farmer. He was also the largest distiller of whiskey in the United States of America. You know, the, these are dimensions of him that have nothing to do with chopping down cherry trees, but make him a real person and make him a legacy that is far more interesting than the myth about throwing silver dollars across the Rappahannock River or about chopping down cherry trees. The truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's what we can get from paying attention to heritage and particularly built heritage. Um, the other thing is because of the durability, built heritage is living heritage. And I am preaching to the choir you know this from being a, a, a resident of Petaluma, that this is your world, that, that, that you know, the, the environment that was created in decades and even centuries before still shapes the character of your community to this day. And uh, the way you treat it, it turns right around and it treats you back the same way. Uh, built heritage is living heritage, it's, it's integral. Uh, to who we are as communities. Um, one other point on this is that, remember, it's, it can be very intentional. It can be kind of propaganda level intent. And I live in the ultimate urban propaganda machine that's ever been built, frankly, Washington, DC. It's, it's amazing. I love it, uh, but, but it is. It's intentional propaganda that says, this is what our nation stands for. And it's wonderful what we say our nation stands for. Um, but that intent has to be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth uh, as well. Uh, the monuments on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia were built during the Jim Crow era. They were not monuments of pride. They were monuments to traitors who, uh, you know, really this, they, they tried to destroy our country. These are the people that we have a Monument Avenue for in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, where, where, where's our value system? Uh, we have to really understand uh, what these things really stand for. And we got a big, big dose of that in 2020. These photos here, the, the one on the left is from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the, on the top right, that's from Bristol, England where they threw a slave trader statue into the water. He was, the found, he was one of the founding fathers of Bristol, real important guy, kind of like mayor of Bristol, but he was also somebody in the slave trade. They threw his statue in, in the water just the same time that the same things were happening in Richmond. And then the others in Montreal, Canada, another slave trader. Um, uh, and then the last thing I'll say about built heritage is that it is being destroyed as we speak and again, you know more about this than I do being in, in California wildfire territory. You know, the, the, the two photos on the bottom are from my world with uh, Annapolis, Maryland and Ellicott City, Maryland being devastated by uh, uh, flooding even when there's no flood, even though when there's no rain, 
sunny day flooding from high tides, um, and then also very devastating rainfall. So, so our built environment is in the crosshairs of climate change. Um, we have the opportunity to apply our stewardship attitudes to this built heritage, but not just from a heritage standpoint, which is super important, but also from a climate action standpoint. So let's drill into that a little. What does that look like? So we have to follow the decarbonization roadmap. And basically the story of the built environment and with decarbonization of the built environment is actually quite a compelling story. Um, since the oil embargo in 73, because we've been paying attention to energy, we have been making buildings much more energy efficient, and we've actually been lowering the carbon footprint of the built environment without ever even really intending to do so in the process. At, at the Paris Agreement uh, meeting in 2015, this story of the American building stock uh, between 2005 and 2015 adding 14 billion square feet of new building and not consuming more energy because we were building better buildings uh, was uh, kind of the talk of the town. It was a very hopeful story about what could happen in climate, in climate change response. Uh, what we need to do in the built environment is very simple. We need to figure out how to operate our buildings without releasing carbon. So how we heat them and cool them, how we make hot water, the way we cook, the power that turns our lights on and runs our computers. What we make them out of needs to be zero carbon. So in other words, the industrial sector that supports the building industry needs to be zero carbon. And we need to get whatever power that we need to operate these incredible cities of ours and these amazing buildings of ours. We need to get that power from renewable resources. It's a pretty simple formula. We also know that even since Paris, the numbers are telling us it's more urgent and that we need to move things along quickly. 2050 is not the date, it's 2040. Uh, we need to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius, not two. The consequences of two degrees are too dire. We need to really ramp it up. So buildings, how do we get buildings that are carbon smart buildings? And I want to start just by saying, you know, just like with the Arab oil embargo, let's think about this as we design buildings. Can we design buildings that require less energy? Can we design buildings that work better with the weather and the climate and the environment to just simply not need this giant uh, fix of, of energy all the time? And the answer is absolutely. And the, the building stock is a great lesson. It's a textbook of how to do that. And some of these lessons going back literally thousands of years. Um, what it means to create a zero net energy building, we understand how to do this now. And we know with, with new buildings like the Bullet Center that is still in a way kind of one of the uh, real poster children of how to do a net, net zero energy building. But even the Wayne Aspinall Federal Building in Colorado, it's a historic preservation project. Uh, but it's a zero net energy building. You know, we, we can do this uh, in, in uh, many, many building scenarios. I, I don't think there's a building in Petaluma that can't be a zero net energy building. You don't have a lot of really large scale buildings. You can deal with these moderate uh, size scale buildings like we're seeing here and have them be zero net energy buildings. Um, and then the, 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 embodied carbon aspect of it. How do we build buildings where we're thinking about not just uh, lowering the amount of carbon that they're releasing, but how about sequestering carbon? And buildings actually have the opportunity to become what are called carbon capture and use uh, properties so that we can literally put carbon into our buildings and sequester it for centuries. Uh, concrete, uh, studies on concrete actually predict that we could, we could uh, sequester half of the carbon that is currently produced today every year in concrete construction. It's a huge opportunity. 
So what do building sector GHGs look like? What, what, what's the real nitty gritty of getting arms around the GHGs in the building sector? I, I wanna just start with a note of caution. Um, you know, uh, Mark Twain said, you know, there's three kinds of lies. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, so you have to be careful with statistics. And these two diagrams show the same data presented two different ways. And the one on the left, which is from a Morgan Stanley study, looks at direct uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, the supply of those greenhouse gas emissions. The one on the right is sorted by demand. Who's actually asking for that electricity? Who's asking for those fossil fuels? And, it, and as you can see, it's, it's a very different sorting of the same data. So this is the demand side. And what you'll see here is, you know, okay, we've got industry, we've got transportation, we've got agriculture, and we have buildings. And, you know, how does this all sort out? Well, the building sector is 39%, and, and it's um, uh, divided between residential, non residential building, between direct emissions and indirect emissions. So, in other words, emissions on site or emissions from the power plants that were getting power to use in our buildings, and then also from the construction industry itself. So actually put those together, 39%, the building sector around the world and also in the United States of America is actually the largest greenhouse gas demanding sector that there is. And I just wanna make one other point on this, and that is how we shape our buildings, how we shape our cities also determines what our transportation systems need to be, what our food growing systems need to be, what our industrial systems need to be. So actually the shape of our cities has a, a, a one foot in all of our decisions, about 100% of our emissions. So uh, we need to be thinking about the design of buildings and design of cities uh, as it influences these other things as well, because it, it, it's all tied together. So uh, we need to start with good information. Okay, and the good information is understanding building statistics. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to give you a flavor of it. There is official US government data kept, kept on our database. Um, the database that you have about the buildings in Petaluma is one of the most important data sets that you need to be able to figure out what your actions need to be. Um, the US uh, building stock, it's about 60% single family houses. We're about the only country in the world that comes anywhere near that number, heavily, heavily uh, uh, leaning towards single family houses. And from what I've seen of Petaluma, having Googled around a bit, uh, you're probably in the same, the same boat, heavily, heavily single family houses. Um, most of my work has been with the commercial building stock, and I won't go into this in any detail, but to just simply point to the blue bars here. So those are the mid-century buildings built after World War II up to the year 2000. All of them are approaching an age where they need money, they need reinvestment, or they're gonna to start to fall apart. So we have 50% of the building stock that if we don't do something about it, it will start to fall apart and we will pay the consequences of that. So literally this is a, a building stock that's calling out to reinvestment. What are we gonna do to reinvest in that building stock? And then kind of the next level of data analysis on this is that actually you look at that a little bit more closely, 6% of those buildings contain half of the area. So how about that for a target? We can, we could, in the United States of America, we can address the conditions in 300,000 buildings and by doing so address half of the area of the commercial building stock. So you start to learn lessons from the data about where your focuses should be, where the, where the real impacts are, are, are possible. Um, and so then how do we do this? What are the things that really we need to be good at? And the number one thing is we need to understand life cycle. 
And when we talk about life cycle, most people get it in terms of, oh, recycling and things like that. That's a, that's a good lens to be looking at it. We tend to think of it at that material level, that what are the cycles of materials? It's production, it's use, it's disposal, and then it's recycling. And on a material level, that, that's a perfectly legitimate way to look at it. I can tell you that for building technology, the place, the Achilles heel of building technology is assembly level life cycle. And that what we do is we take materials, we have put them together into assemblies. This is an insulated glass unit. We seal them together and we make it so that the whole unit uh, lives or dies based on the weakest link. And once that weakest link fails, that's it. The whole assembly is no good anymore. Even though the glass will last for a thousand years, uh, when the seal goes in 20 years, this whole thing just has to get thrown in the landfill. And, and frankly, this is technology that you can't easily recycle. But the, the real holy grail here is to be thinking about whole building life cycle. How do you consider the, the onion that is a building layer upon layer upon layer of different life cycles? And how do you design with those multiple life cycles in mind? Well, let me give you an example. And it gets us right into understanding that both embodied emissions and operational emissions both count. A CO2 molecule doesn't know whether it's embodied or whether it's operational. It just knows it's up there warming the planet. So we have to think about both of them together and how they interact with each other. And I'll just give you this little sample project of, of ours uh, and, and to show how it's done. So this is a, a, a what was an office building in, in Midtown Detroit uh, in a much shrunken office market that we were hired to convert to housing. So what did we do? Well, of course we kept the structure of the building. Uh, we had to completely upgrade the 50 year old uh, curtain wall, the skin of the building, which was leaky and terrible uh, insulating values and so on. So we upgraded that. And then of course we completely redid the whole inside of the building to turn it from an office building, which is mostly empty space into kitchens and bathrooms and bedrooms and living rooms. And we, we completely redid the whole inside of the building. Well, there's an embodied carbon footprint that comes with doing all that work. Uh, upgrading the skin uh, is 368 tons of global warming uh, of CO2 uh, equivalent potential, okay? Uh, the inside was almost a million uh, uh, pounds, so uh, uh, almost a thousand tons. And by simply saving just the columns and the floors of that building, we saved almost 2,000 tons of carbon just by keeping that. So that, that's 2000 tons of avoided carbon, uh, you know, uh, just by that simple act, which sounds like it's not conserving anything worthwhile at all. But so this is the, this is the kind of the math. This is, this is how the calculus works. So there's the existing carbon that we're creating from operating that office building year in, year out. Over 20 years, there it is. There carbon we, we've uh, emitted from that building. So now we're going to renovate this building and we're going to try to change that. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start to add embodied carbon first for the skin, then for the interior work. And then that building is now ready to occupy. And now we're going to start to, to uh, release operational carbon again. And look, in eight years, we are now experiencing a net gain, a net savings We've avoided what was the carbon that this building was emitted after eight years. Now let's do that by tearing the building down and starting all over again with a new building. Well, we have to do the skin, we have to do the interior. We also have to then build that structure that we didn't throw away in the renovation proposal, okay? And now we occupy the building and we start to go through that same operational carbon emissions again. Under this scenario, it takes us a full 20 years. In the 20 year window that we have to solve carbon pollution, we've done nothing by tearing that building down 
and replacing it with the new building. We have saved zero carbon atoms. So is that a good, good, good plan? It, there's no benefit to it until 20 years out. We have to be doing better. And, and it's this combined calculus of environmental impact that we've learned through life cycle assessment, uh, in this case, global warming potential uh, between the two scenarios. So clearly, the renovation scenario is the climate smart scenario here. Um, so I just want to conclude with this uh, uh, kind of where I started. It, it let's not waste the climate crisis. We have to change everything, everywhere. It's going to affect everyone. Uh, let's be smart about it. Let's understand how to leverage it for the maximum benefit uh, to ourselves and our communities. Um, it's a huge undertaking back to Bill Gates. Uh, this is that Morgan Stanley study that I, I took the diagram out of. Morgan Stanley, this is five uh, innovative technologies that they think are important climate technologies, okay? And they're saying, come join us and invest in these technologies. $30 trillion over 10 years. $30 trillion over 10 years. Five technologies. This is a big undertaking. There are people sharpening their knives to make a lot of money out of, out of climate change, okay? This, this, this is how it works in this country, okay? Um, let's not forget the interconnectedness of all these crises. So, you know, if we're going to have peace, we have to work for justice here. Uh, we need to understand how to connect these things. And I'm just going to end this with a little anecdote back to the importance of shaping the built environment. So back in the post-Civil War era in the United States of America, our cities exploded. New York City went from 30,000 to 2 million in less than 50 years, okay? From 30,000 to 2 million in less than 50 years. Can you imagine what the city looked like after that? It was a mess and people were dying. Almost two out of every three people were dying from preventable infectious disease. It was an existential crisis. It was an ur urgent public health crisis that cities like New York and every city, and I'm sure San Francisco was experiencing the same thing. Uh, so what was the solution to this? The solution was changing the infrastructure, changing the, the built environment, changing the cities. So by 1940, which is when penicillin became available to the public, in other words, the medical solution to infectious disease. By the time the medical solution was online, the number had dropped from 64% to 11%. Why? Because of changes in the built environment. And we have exactly the same scenario today. We need to change the built environment to create the conditions that will solve the climate problem. But while we're at it, isn't it also the opportunity for us to talk to, to address all of those other intransigent uh, social, economic, and environmental concerns that are these interlocking crises? And just like John Kennedy, it's time for us to turn the arms race into the space race for climate change and find a way to uh, confront this hour of maximum danger by welcoming it and uh, really getting our arms around it and, and turning it into an engine to do good in our society and in our, our very own home communities. So that's my presentation. And uh, I hope at least a couple of you are still awake. Um, and I would be happy to uh, take a couple of questions. I know that Dan is going to uh, somewhat kind of consolidate. And uh, so let's spend the next 10 minutes or so just addressing the presentation. So I don't see anything in the chat room, but I did notice that Pete had his hand up and then dropped it. Pete, can we put you on the spot? Uh, I was just uh, putting up the hands clapping icon. Ah, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Somebody else has a hand up. Uh, somebody speaking for Sonoma County Conservation Action. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is Steve Burlbo, and uh, I'm working with a similar problem that relates to the conversion of the, uh, the automotive fleet to electric, uh, electric vehicles. And uh, they're having a terrible time accounting for the fact that batteries and electric vehicles embed a whole lot of, of, uh, uh, of, of carbon. Yeah. Uh, and that if you encourage people to uh, scrap their existing vehicle and get a new one, uh, the, the frame of the vehicle embodies a lot as well. Uh, yep. So how do we apply this approach in a, uh, in a in an operation that is constantly replacing its uh, its old vehicles. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's a really serious problem. Uh, probably uh, at, at kind of in the at the invention the invention of the Prius. Um, I used to do a slide comparing uh, driving my crummy old Ford Taurus. Uh, versus replacing it with a wonderful new uh, Toyota Prius. And the fact that in the life of that Prius, I still would not make up uh, all of the uh, greenhouse gas releases from having built the Prius. Um, so uh, this understanding of how to balance uh, operational emissions and uh, embodied emissions is not one that's well understood and it, and it implies it has implications on, on every front. Um, what I would say is, is just two things about it. One is that, uh, so this fall will be the five-year check-in after Paris, it got delayed a year because of the pandemic. Um, embodied carbon is going to be the biggest topic at COP26 because in the last five years, the world has, has woken up to this as a topic topic and go on, oh, you know, your example is the perfect example. Um, the other thing to say is that industry is also woken up to it. And you're beginning to see things like, you know, even what happened at the Exxon board meeting a couple of weeks ago of corporate boards uh, and actually driven by things like their insurance companies, driven by things like their banks that are loaning them money, realizing that they've got to get their arms around the industrial side side of uh, and what that means in terms of embodied carbon. In the architecture world, the number one example of this uh, is uh, what are we doing with the materials that we're building out of? And uh, the kind of two directions that you see there, and, and actually, it, you know, it, around Petaluma, you're definitely seeing the first one, which is this whole notion of building with mass timber building with bio-based materials that sequester carbon as a result of their, their bio-based uh, production by nature. Um, and then the second is uh, alterations by uh, the industrial process, of the industrial processes for things like concrete. And both the, the manufacture of cement, uh, which is the worst part of it, is about 60% of the carbon pollution of, of uh, concrete, even more, sometimes more like 70% is from creating the cements. Um, and then uh, also in the creation of, uh, uh, actually, I'll call them synthetic aggregates. It's actually taking recycled concrete and, and having it sequester additional carbon uh, because it is carbon, you know, calcium uh, uh, carbonate, um, that uh, th this ability to really retool the industrial sector, uh, it's out there. And I'll just give you one more example. In the US, we have about the greenest steel in the world. And why do we have green steel? Because we manufacture it with uh, electric arc furnaces, not blast furnaces. And why do we do that? Well, because we stopped investing in furnaces a long time ago when we had, when, when the steel industry fell apart. And, and as a result of that lack of investment, the only investment that happened were these really small scale investments in these little plants. And they couldn't afford to do those big blast furnaces. The scale wasn't there. So they started to do the small scale 
electric arc furnaces. Well, they can actually be powered with, with renewable energy. You know, so sort of we fell into a greener way of producing steel because we were failing to keep up with the Joneses worldwide in the steel market. So there's some hopeful signs out there that we can actually begin to really get our arms around understanding this relationship between operational and embodied carbon. Works better if you unmute. Bill Wolpert asks, how do we adopt our code, general plan and zoning to keep pace with the change we need to make? Conversely, we can't regulate development without regulation. And I would just toss in here that the reason my workshop has air conditioning is Title 24. So uh, I know that these regulations often go awry. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, gosh, it's, a, it's such a big question. And uh, I wouldn't pretend to know what the solution is for Petaluma. Um, you, you need to be you know, driven by the, the real conditions that you're facing. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute and just kind of, uh, I'll call it prototype, how to have a conversation that is focused on the built environment uh, and how to really find the, you know, uh, an approach to the future in the built environment. Um, but uh, the, certainly the place where the world is starting is by stating its intent, you know, set some goals. And, uh, you know, so that's what the Paris Agreement did. And the Paris Agreement basically set two goals. One was an absolute impact, which is we don't want to raise the temperature more than a certain amount. And then the other was a time frame, And we really feel like we need to get this solved but in, in, in you know, what was then a 35 year period. Um, so uh, that's not a bad model to think about. Um, I've done budgeting uh, that is uh, part of the kind of the five year update to Paris. Uh, so the UN itself said a couple of years after Paris, our model of how we're going to get there is not very clear. We need to be thinking in clearer terms. So the gap report that they issued in 2018, they basically came back and said, you know what, instead of having these kind of vague in intents, let's get real. We have 340 billion tons of carbon that we can spend in the world. So 340 gigatons of carbon before we will exceed any way to stop global warming. So that's our budget. By the way, we're spending 50, 50 gigatons a year to currently. That only gives us six, six and a half years to get it corrected. You know, so we've got to start to make those reductions very quick. But by, having, by understanding what the total budget is, it now gives every country uh, where, how much do we really get to spend? The United States gets to spend 15% of that. And if you take the building sector, which is then 6%, uh, you know, what do we do with our 6%? Well, if you start to look at, wow, it's very finite. You can really start to figure out, is that enough? No, that gets us to 8%. Well, then that's too much. We have to have a plan that stays within 6%. And you know, so there are ways to start to get your your arms around these these uh, uh, you know programs. Mary Dooley has her virtual hand up. Mary, you're muted and on. There Thank you. Uh, uh, just an excellent talk, and uh, the I love the all the sources that you listed, and it's just a great um, study list. Uh, my question is. Um, with the latest, well, I, I don't know how late it is, but the news about the, the shrinking population globally, um, in Petaluma, we, are, we have a very big housing demand. So we, we are under the gun to build housing quickly and a lot of it. And what I'm imagining is in one generation that need will go away. So the idea of an adaptable building seems like the only way to go. And I'm 
I'm just wondering uh, if, if, if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, we have some big boxes in town. Um, we don't have, they're not zoned for housing, but um, that seems to me like adaptability is the key to all of this. I'd like to just hear your comments and thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah well, you know, uh, uh, if you're looking for a job and you decide to move to Washington, let me know. I'll try to get you a job at Quinn Evans Architects because, you know, you you're obviously uh, are brilliant and, you know, you got right to the heart of the matter. Um, you know, so... Uh, um, uh, the adaptability has always been a critical factor in cities. Um, uh, my favorite example is go to Rome and the, and the theater Mar Marcellus, the Teatro Marcello is apartment buildings. You know, back in, back in Caesar's day, they used to go to plays there, you know, uh, any building can be adapted. We, we throw buildings out at the drop of a hat for no good reason. And we call it progress. It's ridiculous. We're so wasteful. And, um, you know, there's been uh, uh, a lot of technical uh, changes to how we make buildings and where we put buildings uh, that um, I think will really define the challenges ahead of us. And the good news is that some of that's really positive. Like modern era buildings are really easy to renovate. You know, they're just these big open frames and you just take what is basically almost, almost you know, uh, cellophane thin outside walls off and put new ones on and there's hardly any material in them. And so there, there's some things to really work with. Um, there are other things that are much more difficult, like, man, we have spread out communities. You know, we. We, uh, we just spread them all over the, over the earth and a particularly American problem too. We, we, we did a way better job at sprawling ourselves out uh, than literally any other country in the world. Um, so at any rate, it's uh, 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 you know, a big topic. Um, uh, I, I'd actually like to switch gears here now um, if that's okay. Uh, I know that there's other questions. I, I hope that to some degree we'll actually get around to them because I want to, again, kind of prototype. Let's talk about some things and recognize that the building sector, the conditions in our built environment are going to influence everything. So how do we have a conversation that is sort of, you know, centered on understanding that we need to understand the conditions that we're creating in the building in the built environment to begin to address those issues. And um, Anne is going to share her screen now and um, become our recorder of record. Um, and so I want to uh, talk about uh, three places in town that are just anecdotes, if you will. They're just, you know, trying to uh, pull a couple of things out of the air, out of thin air for me, frankly. I want to talk about downtown. I want to talk about, you know, Riverside. And then I want to talk about the uh, uh, really, um, you know, the, the kind of the east side and the west side residential neighborhoods. And while we're doing this, Anne is going to, uh, you know, record the things that uh, are the questions you ask or the points that you make. Um, and I'm just going to spend 10 minutes for each one of these and just kind of get a sense of if we're thinking about shaping the built environment uh, to uh, support the things that we care about, what, what does that conversation look like? How, what does it sound like? So the first thing is, is we're going to talk about downtown, and I, and, I, and I assume that I don't have to go to great lengths here to define downtown for you. You know, you, you got the iron fronts, you've got, you know, the Mace, you, know, you, you, know, you know, downtown. And um, let's start by spending a few minutes and just talking about the community character of downtown. Uh, what about it is uh, wonderful and important and needs to be protected? And uh, what about it is not the way it should be. And we would really like to see that evolve. 
So uh, somebody answer one of those questions with the thought. And um, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to, uh, let's see, Dan, can you identify people raising their hands and then uh, get, get them to... Uh, I am scanning through the list right now, waiting for somebody to speak up. Come on, somebody don't, uh, Barry, is that a clap or a request to speak? Oh, it's uh, supposed to be a hand request. Okay. Yeah, Go no, for it. No. It looks old. It looks <laughs> comfortable. Um, it looks aesthetic and it, it's human scale downtown. It drew me in right away. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's stuff to be protected there. It, it it's uh, is it, would you say it's kind of central to Petaluma? And it, yes, yeah. it's absolutely central to Petaluma for me. I live on the west side, so it might be different for some residents. Is it critical to I'll call it the stories of Petaluma that uh, help you define who you feel like you are as a community? Well, yeah, it's historic downtown Petaluma. That's really central. Delinda's got a hand up. Yeah, what I like most about the downtown is the mix of uses. The fact that we have residential and business and services and that it combines it all together. And Natasha? Uh, tagging on to Delinda, what I liked when I first moved here was that it's a mix of uses and it's like a beautiful, it's a beautiful downtown, but it's still a place people live because so many historic downtowns have turned into to uh, tourist attractions. So it's really nice to see, you know, it has all of those aspects you actually need to live like a grocery store and a hardware store and that, you know, dry cleaner and the, it's for real people to live in. So, so what about downtown is problematic? Uh, what, are, what could make downtown better? Less cars. Agreed. Less cars, yeah. less street parking, more more places for people than cars. So uh, maybe uh, Robert Moses won a little bit of that battle with downtown too, and to get back to Jane Jacobs. Yep. Actually, the businesses are winning at this point. Uh, t tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, they're very resistant to taking street parking away because they feel as though that's where their customers come from. We haven't evolved the thinking to know that, you know, when you close down a section of a street, you actually get more pedestrian activity and more visibility and probably more people shopping. Did you get stores kind of coming out onto the sidewalk for, uh, you know, outside dining and things like that during the pandemic? Yes. Maybe some lessons learned there. Yes, a good lesson was learned along the riverfront because the Water Street was not used at all. Um, and then during the pandemic, all the restaurants who backed up to it came out. And now it feels like a beautiful, you know, European promenade with everybody out dining along the river. And it's like, why didn't we do this before? So, so this is a, a, a beautiful start to a conversation. And I'm, I'm just gonna kind of keep us moving along here because the idea is to not really get to, a, to an answer, but to just get a sense about how to have this conversation in, in the sense that, you know, what you just talked about, it, it's really clear that you guys get it, that the conditions that you have in this vital part of town really determine a lot about who you get to be as a community, how you get to behave, you know, and, uh, you know, just the opportunity that you have to run into somebody and, you know, stop on the sidewalk and have a nice conversation and not feel like you're gonna get run over or whatever. Um, so let's talk about the climate change side of this as well. So do you think that there are things about climate change that, that are risks that are going to uh, threaten those conditions in downtown? Are you worried about climate change as, as it might affect downtown? Sea level rise. Okay. 
So downtown is close enough to the water. So it's really part and parcel of that. Uh, I know that's a big issue in the Bay Area. I suspect that as much as sea level rise is an issue, also increased storm size means that there's going to be uh, additional drainage issues. So flooding overall. We're also um, how about just kind of the climate itself. Uh, do, do you is the climate changing? Drought, and Andrew Packard had something to say. I was going to say we're we're busily pa paving over the upper reach of the Petaluma River, so we're exacerbating downtown flooding problems um, mm -hmm. due to some of the um, hundreds of acres that are um, up upstream of downtown um, that are in jeopardy. So let's think about downtown and the way it is, the characteristics that it has that could potentially be assets for uh, just resisting those uh, areas of risk. You know, what about downtown sort of lends itself to be resilient against, uh, you know, faced with these risks of uh, climate disruption? Uh, are the buildings nice, sturdy buildings that, you know, is this a is this a relatively fireproof area that is not going to be consumed by wildfires? I mean, you know, uh, um, is this high enough out of the water so it's maybe not going to get the first place that gets flooded? Uh, you know, and anything like that? What is there anything that jumps out at you about the the the, the qualities of downtown that actually are uh, assets to be uh, to be uh, really uh, worked with. Well, historically, Petaluma is not in the historic wildfire zone, so we become the place where everyone retreats to when Sonoma County is on fire. So that has been an asset. So, um, uh, you know, Anne just wrote a couple of things in there, which I think are really terrific uh, that I'm very happy to see. You know, so uh, the, you know, the first one is literally that it's cared for and therefore it will be, it's cared about, therefore it will be cared for. Uh, that's, that's hugely important in, in communities, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, frankly, I'll call it the, the emotional attachment to places, the very types of things that we started out with that are the, uh, uh, the things to be protected about the community character of downtown, those things will motivate taking care. Those things will motivate, uh, you know, keeping that viable and, and keeping it adaptable. Um, I want to continue to move on, uh, and um, uh, you know this. The, the again, sort of the point of this is to just give you a flavor of if we're thinking about the built environment conditions as something that's going to really influence our ability to accomplish A, B, C, or D, uh, then really looking at its characteristics and trying to understand how it either is supporting and facilitating the goal that we have in mind or frustrating and creating a barrier to the goal we have in mind. It's a really important determinant. And I'll just go back to the, uh, you know, Ed Glazer, is civilization shaping our cities or are cities shaping our civilization? And and I want to move and I think for the sake of making the conversation be more different Let's go to the east side, west side, and let's talk about the residential neighborhoods. So let's go ahead and skip over Riverside for a minute, because Riverside, frankly, is the easy one. Let's let's deal with the little bit harder one. So I I talk I have here this east side, west side neighborhoods, recognizing that to some degree or another, in terms of historic development, the character of the development how sort of car oriented it is, the era of the houses and so on, then in, in, to a certain way, you really have uh, almost sort of two, two towns, the east side town and the west side town. The, the, the physical characteristics of them are actually quite different. 
the challenges and opportunities of them, I think, are actually quite different, even though simplistically, oh, well, they're both residential neighborhoods, they're both largely car dependent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so talking about them as having things in common is fine. Talking about them in terms of them having things that are different, those are both fine. I just want to kind of talk about the residential enclaves uh, that are, uh, you know, the a very substantial portion of what the boots on the ground realities are of Petaluma's, you know, built environment. So, you know, for these uh, east and west side residential neighborhoods, what are the community character aspects of those things that are really important and are good and need to be protected? I'd toss the Victorian architecture of the west side around downtown as one of the positives. Um, somebody described to me a positive way of looking at the character of the homes on the east side. Um, I could say that I, I think that one of the positive aspects of the east side development is the way that there's open space along the, the watersheds that has been preserved. Great. Madeline, you've got a hand up. Yeah, I was going to say um, the east side has traditionally been more affordable, so it's more diverse. Great. Um, let, let me uh, ask uh, about sort of the conditions of uh, these of, of the properties, you know, um, uh, town run down, is the town really, you know, pretty well taken care of? Uh, are these uh, affordable, viable buildings that, uh, you know, the upkeep on them and uh, just, you know, really keeping it viable from one generation to the next. Uh, it, it all works out pretty well. Everybody's able to kind of keep the ball rolling from generation to generation, or, you know, do you feel like there's real struggles there uh, just keeping these properties viable properties? The, I, I don't, I haven't done a real survey of the private portions of that, but the public portions, we're always talking about funds to patch potholes. So clearly we're not, drawing in the revenue necessary to maintain the infrastructure to support these houses. Yeah, um, so uh, actually that, that's a great thing. Let's switch gears a little bit and not think just about the buildings, but think about uh, the lots that the buildings are on and actually also the streets that the buildings are on. I have to tell you that my, again, you know, Google flying around town, uh, and and uh, you know Dave Alden can can uh, confirm me on this. You know I came back to him and said, uh, "Gosh, it seems like your town has a lot of streets. I'd love to know the actual area of what is the percentage of Petaluma that is paved uh, versus um, either building lots or open space. I think that number is very high." So I realize we're getting ahead of Mary on the typing, but in assets we have parks and bike paths on the east side. And Kevin's got his hand up. And after Kevin Barry. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was just thinking um, in terms of the structures on the east side, um, you know, they're um, almost all properties have multiple car garages and, and it's defining. It's, it's face, street forward. And, um, and they're all of similar eras as subdivisions tend to be. And, um, and so there's, there's a mix of kept up and not kept up, but it's, it's not um, tragically different or, or uh, creatively uh, unique. Whereas on the west side, uh, you know, houses uh, filled and lots were vacants for longer eras. So some parts have some sort of uh, um, constant architecture, but the other parts have uh, apartments in next to the beautiful Victorian uh, with a uh, uh, high density of folks right next to, you know, and so it's really eclectic, but uh, one concern I have is, is that uh, those, that older housing stock needs the reinvestment and reinvestment these days is very expensive and it will push out 
uh, all of the um, affordable west side housing, and, and, and that's such a funny expression, um, affordable west side, but, um, but I think what will happen is it, 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 it will change, it will be character defining in town. Uh, those with money will remodel the rundown and uh, run out all those without money. And, and, and I think it's the, it's a California or Sonoma phenomenon to um, be pushing the middle class really hard away. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it sounds like sort of the California version of gentrification, which is the uh, very much a concern around where I live as well. Um, so I, I just want to go ahead and switch gears and let's talk about climate change and the risks and assets aspects of it. So how do you think that climate change affects these residential enclaves what what how is it going, how is it going to affect life well I, I if i could make one point Dan. go ahead um yeah i think it'll affect the west side sooner the um the, the west side is more political and more engaged and will uh, feel fear a crisis imminent and the uh, east side is more of a commuter town and will um be a little slower to the party, a little slower to the realization, and we'll continue to have two towns um, based on the how concerned each party is. So it sounds to me like the uh, east side is the first candidate for the uh, electric car chargers to be installed. Barry's got his hand up. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, actually, I first of all, thing with comment made in the larger picture. In my more direct um, uh, personal experience, um, I live on the west side. I've lived on the east side also. I spend, I've spent time bike riding and walking on the east side. And, and you, if you're out of your house, you live on concrete. And that gets hot. And I, I just, I feel so, I actually, they have great bike paths and the water on the waterways on the east side, which I envy. But, but if you're going down streets, they're wide, they're concrete, they're hot, they're barren, they have very few trees, and the few people I see aren't talking to each other. I just think it seems like an oppressive place to live it, as it gets hotter. So Linda, did you actually still have your hand up or is that an accident? And Veronica has her hand up. Yes, I was just saying, um, I think in terms of zoning, we're gonna probably um, maybe looking at the east side as creating more, more neighborhoods by creating more accessible amenities closer to where people live. Um, it's gonna be something that we're gonna need to look at as, as the climate, as we heat up, so. The advantage the east side has is that it's higher above sea level. So the west side might be panicked more and adapt, you know, taking more uh, measures, but we'll go on, we'll go underwater faster. So east side might be the place we all end up. So um, uh, we're pretty much running out of time here. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of wrap this up to say, again, you know, this is obviously very much of an, on a brainstorming level, but uh, it is the type of conversation that's very important to have uh, that um, I, I've started these conversations with uh, kind of this uh, strength and weaknesses, opportunities and, and threats discussion about community character uh, because it's way easy to just get into the nitty gritty of all the little technical things that need to be solved. And you lose the forest for the trees so quickly when you do that. Um, we, we are confronted with, and I, I, I can't use this terminology frequently enough, we have to retool everything that we're doing, our transportation, our industry, how we do our, how we put our buildings together, how we operate and, and, and alter our buildings. We have to retool everything. 
And we have to do it everywhere. It, you know, every building in Petaluma needs to become a zero net energy building in the next 20 years. Now, one way to do that is to change the electric grid and to make it so that you're no longer just importing, you know, polluting electricity. But another way is you have to get like the natural gas out of the town. You know, all, all the natural gas appliances, they all need to go. There's no such thing as a zero carbon gas stove. There's no such thing as a zero carbon gas water heater or, 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 or boiler. That whole infrastructure, that has to go. And it's got to go by 2040. You know, so there's some big sweeping important things that, that need to get done. And it's so easy to sort of get lost in that, like, oh my God, you're going to take my, my gas grill away, you know, over my dead body. Um, and the only way to have that conversation and to really have it be uh, open to everybody and fair to everybody and meaningful to everybody and give us a chance to actually find the common ground that we need to really move forward to, to retool everything everywhere that's going to affect everybody is to really start with what is the character of our town? Who are we? Who do we want to be uh, when we've made these changes? And really get to, uh, therefore, what's important to us uh, and, really, and really to the things that matter and, and the things that we realize that we can and will let go of. So um, I hope this, this evening was uh, useful to you and uh, will help you move forward. You have a wonderful town and I can't wait to come and visit there. Um, and you have a wonderful group of community leaders that are behind this know before you grow out who are really trying to do the right thing and are putting tremendous amount of time and effort to try to get your community the resources that it needs to really do the right thing. And it's just been great to be a part of it tonight. And I hope that this has been uh, useful for you. Thank you so much, Carl. I really, really appreciate all the time. It's been wonderful getting to know you over the last few weeks. I hope we can stay in touch. And I do hope that you really do come visit us uh, out here in Petaluma. Uh, Dan, do you have any last minute announcements you want to make about upcoming or that just happens at the beginning? Dan, you're oh, muted. You're muted. <laughs> After all that, and uh, <laughs> sorry, Ann, for forcing your screen stop sharing. Uh, just that in two weeks, we've got the next one. And a week after that, we've got uh, another one. And please keep the conversation going. And Dave, are we going to join? Well, we can announce that the next one if we're going to do the Thursday uh, discussion, planning, state of the state of the union kind of thing. Um, that we the Thursday lunch, um, which I believe is fourth Thursday now. Fourth, yeah. The uh, Urban Chat, which is the parent group of Know Before You Grow, has, will turn its monthly meetings into an in-person meeting for the first time in a year and a half. Uh, whatever the fourth Thursday is, Aquas Cafe noon to talk about exactly these topics. Thank you very, very much, Carl. And yes, Natasha, unless you've got anything additional, I will end the meeting and prep this for uploading to YouTube. Yes, yes, there will be a recording. So if you have friends that you think should see this, um, please share. Wonderful. And Carl, thank you again. I hope this isn't the last we see of you. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night. And Good to see everybody. Good night.